For years, Hollywood has tried relentlessly to bring to life the exciting and diverse team dynamic of one of Marvel's most iconic and best-selling comic book franchises, the X-Men. With 11 live-action films, of, well, 13 if you count the Deadpool movies, which we kind of have to, and billions of studio dollars given to them over the years, you'd think that we'd have covered the best stories from the pages and brought them into cinema. And while I think there are plenty of good moments hidden in these movies, and some movies in the franchise that are beyond expectations, I also think that the true potential of the X-Men and their complicated interpersonal nuance has yet to be fully realized on the big screen. That's not to say that I don't enjoy movies like the original X-Men and First Class, and of course Logan, which is easily the most bleak and disturbing film that Fox has ever made with Jackman as Wolverine. And maybe it's just my generation, but when I think of X-Men, I think of the so Opie and dramatic cartoon series from 1997 which shaped my obsession with mutants and their stories as a young comic book fan. And that makes today's movie slightly more disappointing, as we're about to revisit a film that takes one of Marvel's most iconic comic book events and makes a bold attempt to bring it to reality with the Dark Phoenix saga. Nope, not that one. This one. A personality that in our sessions came to call itself the Phoenix. Now, I'm personally a pretty big fan of the character of Jean Grey and the Phoenix, but my love for the character and her duality of good and evil exists only in print, as I don't think this storyline can be done justly in just one film. After all, the comic book and the cartoon dedicated multiple books and episodes to this arc, and for very good reason. It's it's complicated. But at the end of the day, X-Men The Last Stand is about much more than just Gene. It's a movie about loss, intolerance, rebellion, and the ever-growing longing for mutants to be accepted among humans. And also it features some classic in-universe plot holes that make the entire experience very difficult to take as canon. I don't have to explain myself, least of all to you. Seriously, why do these movies have such a hard time keeping their story straight? Like, am I missing something? So, if you're ready, then grab your black leather jumpsuit and don't forget to like the video, because we are about to enter the danger room and revisit X-Men The Last Stand. Okay, true believers, we're at the end of the original X-Men trilogy. If you saw our videos revisiting the last two films, you'll know that I'm a pretty big fan of the first film, and not as big a fan of the second film. And in 2006, when this installment was released, I was expecting to see something more groundbreaking as a result of the rapid advancement of special effects in Hollywood and the increasingly experienced cast of celebrities who inhabit the roles. But instead, what we got is a bloated story that is packed to the brim with storylines that try to tie off the series with as little loose ends as possible. After the success of X-Men and the boom in comic book movies, it was inevitable that X-Men would continue its run in cinema with a second and third film. But when the director of the original films, Brian Singer, chose to leave the project in favor of Superman Returns, Fox was at a standstill on how to end his trilogy. So they went to Matthew Vaughn, the director of Kick-Ass, Kingsman, and First Class. And he… he wasn't available. So instead, they got Rush Hour director Brett Radner to step in to direct. Was this a mistake? Yeah. What have I done? But they also considered talent like Darren Aronofsky and Joss Whedon to take the helm. Poor Aronofsky just can't catch a break with superhero movies, can he? But after some development issues and having studio interference in full swing before even hiring an official director, the movie's writing was doomed from the very beginning. Really? I doubt that. When the idea to bring the Phoenix Saga into the script was presented, Fox felt like it was too dark for a fun summer blockbuster and they scrapped the idea. It wasn't until later that it was watered down by subsequent unrelated plot lines and then it was approved to be in the story. And that just has the studio's lack of understanding of the X-Men written all over it. I don't want to play games with you. I want answers. You don't want to play games with me? Like I said, doomed. X-Men The Last Stand is the third film in the original trilogy and picks up shortly after the events of the second film. The last time we saw the X-Men, they were struggling to save the day but just narrowly escaping a watery grave with Jean Grey making the ultimate sacrifice to save her friends. She's gone. Don't! You don't say that! 
be able to go back. She's gone. No! The Last Stand uses those events to motivate the story, while also trying to build up to an epic final showdown between the X-Men and the Brotherhood of Mutants and the US government. And I don't want to speak for everyone, but honestly, the government is completely out of whack in these movies. Nobody seems to have anything to say except mutant bad and human good, which would be fine if this wasn't the basis for literally everything that's happening in this whole trilogy. Xavier and the core team, Cyclops, Wolverine, and Storm, are grieving the death of Jean and each character is handling it differently. But when Jean returns, she comes back different, darker. And upon her return, she's recruited by Magneto to lead the new brotherhood on a fight for their freedom by destroying the government and their newfound, quote, cure for mutation. The X-Men need to band together one more time to save the day and bring Jean back from the dark path she's taken as the Phoenix. Don't let it control you. To set the story in motion, we get some flashbacks to the past and plenty of exposition to try rushing Jean's never-before-mentioned duality. You have more power than you can imagine, Jean. The question is, will you control that power? Ugh, it's so frustrating, but it gets worse. Charles and Eric visit a suburban home, and we see that Charles still has full use of his legs. They're trying to recruit Jean to their school for gifted mutants, and successfully persuade her and her parents. Now, first we need to address the 2006 CGI de-aging attempt that director Brett Radner decided to go with. Here's a hot take. It doesn't look that much different than Marvel's de-aging technology today. That depends if you think it's a poor attempt to replicate my work. Even for this group, that takes nerve. For real, I mean, maybe they've enhanced it for HD on Disney+, Plus, which would not be surprising, but it honestly isn't terrible. I mean, sure, it's a bit rubbery and overly smooth, but let's face it, that's just how Marvel movies look. I also think it's important to remember that the Phoenix has never been mentioned in these movies before, which makes the attempt to shoehorn it into this movie even more sad. For context, this is an entire saga in the X-Men comics and had a five episode arc in the cartoon, which was fully dedicated to that one story, as opposed to this movie which tries to balance the arc of Jean with a million other spinning plates. Things like a mutant cure, a war between man and mutant, a love triangle with Iceman, Rogue, and Shadowcat for some reason, and of course the incredible sibling-like rivalry between Magneto and Professor X. And that last one I actually love. Charles Xavier did more for mutants than you'll ever know. My single greatest regret is that he had to die for our dream to live. We also get an introduction to an iconic X-Men member from the original comics, Archangel, or Angel, played here by the underappreciated Ben Foster. Haven't we seen him and Rebecca Romaine in another Marvel movie before? Hmm. I actually love this scene where we see a young angel locked in the bathroom trying to surgically remove his angel wings before his father finds out that he's a mutant. It's heartbreaking, and yet it shows the current state of fear-mongering against mutants in this reality. And also, it sets up Angel's father as the man who's motivated to develop a cure. Scott isn't doing well after the loss of Gene. He's not teaching his classes at the school, he's not joining them for missions, and he's definitely not up for any of Logan's antics. Not everybody heals as fast as you, Logan. When he goes to the lake where Jean died, he senses her presence through telepathic communication. And then, a whopping like 15 minutes into the movie, he dies. That's it. He just dies. That's what happens. Cyclops just dies. Tell me what happened to him. Ugh. So now Jean is back at the X-Mansion where Charles attempts to free her from her murderous tendencies and bring her back to the Jean Grey that we all know and love. Charles gives Logan some exposition explaining that he's known about Jean's dark side since the very beginning, and he didn't think to tell anybody about this? <sighs> Meanwhile, Bobby Drake, played here by Sean Ashmore, is caught in a love triangle with his longtime girlfriend Rogue, played by Anna Paquin, and Kitty Pride, played here by Elliot Page, which goes absolutely nowhere. It's maybe the most unnecessary drama in the movie, and it doesn't even have a real payoff. Rogue is feeling insecure about not being able to touch Bobby physically when she hears about this new mutant cure, which can immediately preserve the human DNA of mutants while killing off the mutation. Rogue wants in on it, but doesn't really know how to tell the group. 
I want to be able to touch people, Logan. A hug. A handshake. And that's part of what I find so troubling about this movie as well. The X-Men could not be more disbanded at this point. Not on purpose, they just all have their own storylines going on and none of them seem to overlap. Now during all of this, Magneto, Pyro, and Mystique are recruiting some new talent for their Brotherhood of Mutants in the form of Callisto, Multiple Man, Kid Omega, and of course... The Juggernaut, bitch! The plan is to locate the source of the cure, a young mutant called Leech, who's kind of an anti-mutant. He's a young kid whose ability is to reverse mutation. So naturally, the government is using his blood to make a serum that can supposedly cure mutants of their powers. Magneto and the New Brotherhood want to find Leech and stop the cure from being distributed. They wish to cure us, but I say to you, we are the cure! The X-Men, now without Cyclops because he just died, enlist the help of a genius level mutant called Beast, played by Kelsey Grammer, who looks, sounds, and acts perfectly as this big blue Einstein. As Churchill said, there comes a time when all men must- <laughs> Oh, oh, you get the point! Seriously, I don't know what it is with Fox and Blue Mutants, but whenever they try to do a Blue Mutant, it looks amazing in these movies. Like, look at Mystique and Nightcrawler. But this cool stuff with Beast is ruined pretty quickly when Charles, Storm, and Logan find Jean and try to bring her back to her normal self. And then, Professor X dies. Well, not really, but... We'll get into that. And you know what? It's not even earned. It's just as forced as Cyclops' ridiculous exit to this franchise. So, the X-Men are recruiting to help save Jean, who has joined Magneto's Brotherhood, and stop them from destroying the cure. It, it seems like everybody's just recruiting. That's like the entire movie is recruiting. So, you have talents. That and more. You guys remember how Logan was kind of like the main character of the first movie? Well, he takes a backseat in this film along with almost everybody else. It's weird to see so many cool characters in this movie and almost none of them get any development. Beast is awesome, but he really only shows up for a few scenes. Juggernaut was exciting to see, although his character was just made to be a big dumb brute. And all the hype we get for Angel is completely deflated as he's literally useless in this movie. He's in like three scenes and says like five words and that's it. I was told that this was a safe place for mutants. However, while the story is all over the place and the characters are treated like disposable nothing superheroes and it's packed with bullshit like Iceman freezing a fountain so he can ice skate with Kitty, there's also a few things that deserve some praise upon this rewatch. For example, we get to see The Danger Room, a brief look at The Sentinels, and an amazing performance from Sir Ian McKellen, and even an interesting take on Wolverine's Berserker Rage. Finally. Now, remember, true believers, the X-Men was always envisioned as a soap opera, serialized stories about interpersonal relationships between students at a special school isn't that far off from any one of the teen dramas we grew up on. But here's the issue. The X-Men in these movies are just a blend of adults who are already in full control of their powers, and kids who get no attention in the film, and all we get to tie them together is a few action scenes where the students and their teachers from Xavier's school work together to have a super-powered battle with other mutants. There isn't any writing dedicated to the individual characters. I would have liked to have seen some of the B-plots dropped from this movie in favor of giving more development to a character like Leech, who is a very interesting mutant in his own right, but also completely underused and underserved in the story. It pisses me off that we get more scenes where Bobby is low-key flirting with Kitty than we get of Angel and his interesting backstory. In the comics, Warren, or Angel, is the son of a billionaire who works in an anti-mutant research group. And he's ashamed of his gifts until Xavier and the X-Men help him love himself. In the movie, he's just a kid who hates his mutation when he's like 10, but then when the father tries to cure him later in his life, he just doesn't want to do it. Wait. I can't do this. But why? Could we not get like five extra minutes dedicated to this? It just seems kind of important. 
So throughout the movie, everybody is kind of split up, but it all culminates in a final battle that pits the Brotherhood against the humans and the X-Men against both of them. Again, there is some stuff to appreciate in this scene. We get to see Bobby turn into full Iceman, which is fun. We get to see Wolverine pop his claws and do some damage, which is always sick. And Beast finally gets some combat to contrast his otherwise fully composed character. Let your freak flag fly, Hank. We love you. You realize the level of impact this will have on the mutant community? Yes. Jean by this point has been fully taken by the Phoenix persona, although none of her development happens on screen, of course. And Wolverine uses his ability to heal himself to stand up against her when no one else can, and ultimately he's forced to kill her with his claws in order to save everyone else from her raw power. Something that again, would be nice to fully flesh out within the movie so that this scene doesn't come off as a completely silly resolution to a very real conflict. Way to go, boys. Way to go. Maybe it's time for us to move on. Magneto is shot with the cure and seemingly stripped of his powers, which brings the realization to him that he has messed up bad. He flees with the rest of the Brotherhood, and the day is officially saved. And oh yeah, I forgot to mention that Mystique is also cured of her abilities, and Magneto just drops her cold like halfway through the movie. This is Shay. She was so beautiful. Director Brett Radner had brought us a final installment that didn't work for anyone. The film was poorly received for good reason by audiences, and the box office take, while being solid at over 400 million, was not matched in the film's underwhelming reviews. Well, that's ridiculous. For my money, the key to making a good X-Men movie is to spend time developing the long list of interesting characters and seeing them as individuals who are part of a collective team, as opposed to making a team-up movie where nobody has time to be seen or heard as a person. X-Men is all about inclusion and embracing diversity, yet this movie treats all mutants like generic teenagers who occasionally work with other generic teenagers to stop a threat. And that's just not what I, or many of you, want from an X-Men movie. This is proven by the franchise's later attempts to redcon this movie in favor of a prequel, sequel, spin-off series known widely as the First Class series, which tracks the same characters through a different timeline. It's a much better series, and some installments in it are way better than others, and this is something that we will undoubtedly be covering in the future, along with the Wolverine trilogy and New Mutants, eventually. Which, by the way, I do have some hot takes on those movies, and you are not going to want to miss that. You know, sometimes when you cage the beast, the beast gets angry. You have no idea. X-Men The Last Stand is too dumb to be considered dumb fun, and yet it's too dense to be considered a nothing movie. I think if you want to recreate the Phoenix Saga in live action ever again, maybe this time do it over like a limited series and dedicate the entire main storyline to that one plot. No more of this flip-floppy and convoluted stories, okay Marvel? Just give it to us the way we want it. The right way. Thank you all for watching this episode of Marvel Revisited, and we will see you next time. Class dismissed.